So tonight is a drink special. It's the Mad Max. It's only for seven dollars. It's a PBR tall boy because they ain't no short boys for PBRs. It's a tall boy and a shot of old Krill for only seven bucks. The Mad Max Portland's Death Trolley. <laughs> so yeah, I definitely want to uh, to thank the Jack London Bar for having us down here tonight. I want to thank Melissa, the intern, too, for all the work that she does, including the awesome fucking tram. The tram, man. And I have to thank Brock from Sprocket Podcast. He's recording this show so you can hear the entirety on the interwebs because they aren't already filled with enough shit. We have to put some more out there. Oh, and Brock bought Dr. Jeff a beer, too, which is awesome. Yeah, definitely. All right, that's the housekeeping shit. Uh, my name is Doug Kent Crispin, and I'm the Revolve Resident Historian from Kick-Ass Oregon History. Thank you. Uh, my one thing out there, thank you, I appreciate it. And fuck you all, thank you. Uh, you're interrupting my flow. See, I ride the bus every day. Every fucking day I ride the bus, and I've pretty much done so in this town since 1983. And I wrote this little, and I know I, I have a youthful appearance in the car, but I wrote this little piece that I'm calling Lost and Found. So tonight you're gonna hear a lot of fucking happy, huggy stories about riding the bus, and somebody has to be a contrarian, so that's fucking me. I mean, I'm the guy that told you about all the people that got killed by Max, right? So um, I'm stepping up and I'm doing that kind of thing tonight. I'm going to give you the other side. So that the rest of everybody can get up here and we can have a little fucking love fest about how awesome we're trying to do this, okay? So, I am a bus person. Now there are bus people and there are train people, okay? Are, are there tram people? And I don't mean doctors, because that's kind of bullshit. Are there tram? I don't know if there's fucking tram people. But, you know, there are people who just ride the Max. They drove cars before there was a Max. And I'm not one of those people. I mean, I ride the Max every once in a while. It just kind of happens. But I feel like I'm in a tourist in a different fucking city when I get that thing. Like I'm going to visit a museum or something. I just don't dig it. I don't care for the Max at all. In fact, I actually miss the five interstate. And I would gladly, fucking gladly, trade the yellow line to get that fucking tweaker bendable bus back. I fucking miss it. I am a bus person. And I always sit at the back of the bus, the very last fucking row. It feels like I have more time to see the world as it approaches and as it goes by the window. I have a little bit longer to take in all of Portland as it slowly moves by the traveling bus windows. It's like a reality show every fucking day for two 45 minute segments. If the phrase didn't want to make me gag, I might say it's the real Portlandia, but I just can't fucking do that. And I see everything in our city. I see the good, I see the bad, and I see the shitty. And as we'll find out tonight, that isn't always a good thing. But I think the main reason that I ride at the back of the bus is maybe, just maybe, I don't trust any of you fuckers out there. Not a one of you. And I like to keep my eyes on every fucking one of you as we head down that road. And I see a lot of things as I sit in the back row. The entire bus is there for me to survey. This slice of humanity on wheels, nice, huh? This slice of humanity on wheels is there for me to witness, and I see it all. I take it all in, every fucking detail. I'm a mute spectator to this drama as it proceeds to the formerly Fairless Square. Sometimes I interject into the scene that is laid out for me to enjoy. A man who was sitting next to me on the back bench, he left his debit card on the seat. I piped up, hey, you left your debit card. He got it for me and he thanked me with the slightest, the slightest of a fucking nod. But that's cool. <laughs> Little deer bird. Lost and found. You know, I've never, ever parted with any of my physical belongings on the bus. In the 29 years that I've ridden the bus, I have never left a material object behind. 
Which makes me wonder about you fucking people. The people out there that I see on the public conveyance machine every fucking day. Now, I tried to arrange for a tour of TriMet's Lost and Found for this chat, but they wouldn't return my calls. <laughs> like, look at that fucking Mad Max guy, right? That shit was real funny. Yeah, they wouldn't call me back. Maybe they lost my messages, I don't know. I wanted to see the, sorry, I wanted to see the facility and take pictures of it and show you them and talk to you about those pictures. Tell you how the lost and found process works. Because I've never fucking been there. I don't know. I've never lost anything on the bus. Now, TriMet's website says, complete the form below to report a lost item to lost and found. After 14 days, unclaimed items are donated to charity. Please note, we do not return phone calls unless we have located your item. I guess that's helpful. I don't know. But I'm picturing a labyrinth beneath Pioneer Square with boxes of wallets and phones and iPods and tattered paperbacks of existential authors. There's even a few umbrellas in my vision, oddly enough. All of these things that people left on the bus even though the helpful fucking signs told them not to do so. Even though some of you people don't have OCD like me, and you haven't fucking learned to check your pockets when you arise from the back of your seat thrice. You still leave your belongings. You get up, you get off the bus, and you leave your shit behind, and all that clutter ends up in a bin in a room of forgotten encumbrances. But, let me say, I have a couple of them, lady. I have lost things on TriMet. But not cards or jackets or earbuds or non-Sony Walkmans. Dave remembers those. Less tangible things. Things that you can't check your pockets thrice to see if you're a dad with. I lost the illusion of lust on TriMet. <laughs> Near the steel bridge, by the abutments by Naito, a dirty man sat in the brown grass with his pants around his ankles and a bottle in a bag in one hand. His other hand was on another man's head, who was completely fucking naked, with grime and filth covering his shameless form. The naked man was on his knees in front of the other. His head was bobbing up and down in the other man's lap, save for when he stopped to take a deep drink of booze from the offered brown paper bag. <laughs> the smile on the receiver's face was surely large, but it was hidden in the matted, dready beard. I do not make this shit up, I'm a fucking historian. <laughs> the whole encounter had a feeling of a transactional nature, but for the life of me, I could not fucking imagine what commodity was being exchanged. What was this man actually getting for this epic blowjob? Was it just another deep drink of cheap liquor? Bum love has replaced lust in my visual inventory while riding on the number one. I lost the myth of romance on TriMet. August, the mind-boggling, stifling heat that can only come when air conditioning works best with the windows closed, and they fucking weren't. A man and a woman, the rush hour packed bus. Standing near the back door, they couple. The smell of cheap liquor and sweat and piss rose off of them in the domineering heat of the bus. You know the smell. Well, you fucking people who ride the mats, you don't know that smell. <laughs> but the rest of us do. The smell creates such a unique scent that is truly individual in olfactory provenance. Somehow the smell of the bus gets mixed in there as well, and it's a really fucking distinct bouquet. Their hairs were both stringy and matted. It looked and smelled like they had not bathed in an August week. His greasy tongue was sticking out of his mouth, and he would slip it in the gap between her front teeth. She must have been missing eight or ten of them. He swayed from the drunkenness, and she had to catch him several times as the bus made turns. 
She was a large woman, but her stained and filthy daisy dudes were quite small. They allowed his grimy fingers an aperture as he probed her vagina. Yes, yes, while sticking his tongue into the where her teeth should have been place. With one hand, she held the handrail above, and with the other, she tried to remove his fingers from her fleshy folds. Now, in a don't you do that way, but more in a let's wait until we get off the bus way. <laughs> But he was persistent and not steady on his feet. So she just tried to curtail it as much as possible. And she looked about apologetic to the other riders. They finally left the packed bus on Williams. He disembarked, was summoned assistance, and promptly puked on the street. Romance is not always roses, I learned on the 55. Nice. I lost the last vestiges of blissful ignorance I possessed in 1998 on a tri bus. I was crossing the steel bridge and saw several ambulances and police cars in the right lane attending some sort of accident. I found out later that two 20-something junkies, Michael Douglas and Warren McGowan, had hung themselves off the side of the bridge, a suicide pact, as they were recently homeless and unable to curb their $200 a day heroin addiction. Douglas wrote in a 13 page journal found in the book bag slung over his shoulder. He wrote, I think I've decided an old fashioned public hanging. The steel bridge shall be my gallows. Moore and I go together on the steel bridge. There is no more ignorance, all hope that was lost on that July 1st on the number 40. Sorry to be a bummer. So fuck you. <laughs> Everyday absent-minded commuter, fuck you. Digging through the bins under Pioneer Square, looking for your iPod that you lost, or your umbrella that has the logo of Spirit Mountain Casino, Spirit Mountain Casino in place and on it. <laughs> fuck you, tweaker, as you tell me about your lost check that you left on the max, and could I hit you up with a fin to help you through the day? And fuck you, you literate hipster as you bitch about how your copy of The Stranger that you left on the number four wasn't in the lost and found cheesy fucking book bin at TriMet. Yeah, I'm sure somebody fucking stole it. Fuck you all. Where's my bin at Pioneer Square? Where's the bin full of innocence? Where's the pile of romance kept? Do you have some unclaimed ignorance? Cause I could really fucking use mine back, man. You can replace your iPod or your umbrella or get an alternate for pals.com for your deeply fucking cherished literature. These new to you physical items to carry in your hands until you lose them again right on the same goddamn bus as last time. This option, however, is fucking unavailable to me. I've traded my lost things out for images of bum blowing and drunken puking fondling, and two young Portlanders dangling from the black light tar rails of the steel bridge. Fuck you, TriMet, and fuck you for the things that I've lost while sitting in the back row of your buses. I'll never have them back. If only every fucking day I had driven a car. Thank you.
to you about cussing. Um, now I know that, that Doug didn't do much of it, but um, I have I have been a problem with cussing. Cussing's great with me, um, as my boss who's here knows. Um, cussing is inappropriate times is fine with me, but I have one particular pet peeve, and that is we don't cuss around boys. Just you know, I'm I'm old school in that one regard. Um, and just about a week ago, this is actually not my story, but this is a preface to the story. So I ride the bus. Um, with my daughter every morning to go to school. And we don't see any of the things that Doug sees, which is just totally exciting to me now. I didn't realize how awesome my boring ass number 35 was. Uh, I call it the library bus because people just go on, yeah, booyah! Um, actually, the 35 year old like, are walking up behind us, and one of them is just, fucking hey, if I took a fucking job, it wouldn't be the fucking problem, I don't know what the fuck I'm thinking, blah, 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 and I'm hearing this, and I'm with my daughter, and it's like, you know, this is in public, what can you do, but I hear his friend say, hey, I love children. <laughs>
for these two loud guys who were yelling across the way and just punctuating it with cusses. And so there comes that moment when you realize, it's like, okay, in the movie, this would be where you would stand up and say, would you please not cuss in front of the child? And in the movie, that would go as really good. Like, oh, I apologize, you know? Forgive me, I will be much quieter now. Oh, thank you so much for God saying that. Um, I'll put it right here on this laptop.
man's still up there. Hey, what the fuck are you doing? Look at the racist here. And, and, and my daughter's looking around like, what the fuck is going on? Since <laughs> cause she's used to the 35, where everybody's just getting chilling, you know? You know, you're not doing anything. So I'm sitting there totally uncomfortable, and I'm fairly certain that these two guys are going to get off my stuff. And it was just like, oh, fuck, I got my friend with me, I got my daughter in my arm, this, this is not going to be a good fight, you know? Um, I'm going to give you a hint, and I was going to lose that one. Um, even with my friend, who was, my friend was kind of that whole same thing, of like, what the fuck, this, this is, the whole scene is getting weird. So I turned to the guy, and I said, look, man, I'm not trying to fucking squash your First Amendment rights. I was just asking a favor. And I turned around, and there's a tiny minuscule pause, and he's like, fucking, no, actually, he said, let's get off at Killingsworth. Yeah. Now, Killingsworth is still quite a ways away from where we're going. And I don't I hear it, he's yelling, and he's clearly yelling to say, you can't tell me to be quiet, man. I can fucking do what I want. But as he's yelling more, I'm realizing he's not swearing. There's no swears involved at all. And I'm like conscious of it all the while planning, you know, writing my will in my head. <laughs> and because it was just like, man, this is just, I was an uncomfortable situation. And it was an un uncomfortable situation for everyone all around me. And I really wish it had been this swearing bus. Um, so, but I'm listening to the guy, and he is not swearing at all. But he's still very, very loud, making sure that he shows I can do whatever I want. But he doesn't swear once. And the, and we go to the next stop, and people get off, and people get off the next one, and pretty soon he can move up to the front with the friend. And I'm talking to my daughter, trying to just kind of chill around the whole, wow, well, that was a fucked up ride, wasn't it? And, uh, not the exact words I used. <laughs> That's that seemed very critical. Um, I said, this is effed, huh? Um, and so while I'm focusing on her, these guys got off. I didn't even see him get off. And the thing that seemed weird, like I was very excited. I was really excited I wasn't gonna get beaten up. Um, this is something that I don't I don't often have that exact sensation because I very rarely get myself into circumstances where I might get beaten up. But this one particular situation where it was like, holy shit, I just dodged a bullet. And uh, and I, I was feeling very excited about that. But I felt like a genuine sadness as well, because he had honored my request. I had asked him a favor, and despite him being loud, he still had, he, he'd done it. He then he stopped swearing. And I, and I kind of felt, I was like, I need to give him the man nod, you know? And he, I needed to be like, dude, thank you. And I, and I, and I couldn't, and I, and it was weird, because as I got off the bus, in this whole slew of emotions, the strongest emotion I had was, I wish I could have said thank you. Because he did stop. So, if during mode open mic, somebody comes up here and tells a story about his asshole dad, and he fucking asked a favor, got the favor, and didn't say a goddamn thing, that's an absolutely true story. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Jeff. Are you ready, sir? One, one quick point. Naked Winery is right over there. And they have free fucking wine. Man. Go get some samples. It's awesome. It's, it's the best stuff to come out of Hood River since... Uh, I, had, I had a really good joint from Hood River once. Maybe since then. I, it might even be better. Anyways, I like having a point in there. I'm ready. We don't have joy. We do not have marijuana. There's no marijuana over here. Public service that there's no marijuana at the uh, Naked Winery. It turns out that the blonde guy on, on uh, Mr. Reagan's bus was actually the young Doug Camp Crispin who lost his youth on the bus as well. Well, I feel weird without a shot of vodka in my hand. <laughs> 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 this is my beer. She's not 
dropping my own beer. Oh, that's better. That's better. So they asked me to come talk at this thing again. And when I did this last time, I commuted four hours a day on time Oh, Jesus. Let's hear it. Oh, Jesus. Four hours a day, which is 20 hours a week, which is an unpaid half-time job. How do you do unpaid half-time job helping children or like adopting, you know, homeless dogs? I had a half-time job unpaid sitting with people who smelled bad on the bus and on the max to Forest Grove every day from the Gateway Transit Center. And the weird thing is, I changed jobs about a month and a half ago, and I felt really guilty. I felt really guilty that I was no longer that guy who was the sort of heroic commuter on the bus for four hours a day. It got really strange. I, I, what do you do when you're on the bus and the train for four hours a day? I tweeted, what, you guys are put 30, 40, 50 times a day. It's one of those guys that you friended and then unfriended, like, you know, two days later. Holy shit! What? I don't care what shoes the guy is wearing on the train, I'm stupid. He needs to call me fuckface! I called him a fuckface, yeah. Yeah, I should have walked up and said, hello, little fuckfaces, because that's what I called on my Twitter from when I was actually tweeting. But, after a while, you become kind of a, an internet celebrity. And let me tell you, internet celebrity is amazing. It's weird. I got recognized on um, Somebody, I, I was kind of just like, had my head in my phone and I was tweeting something and I looked over and this girl was standing across the way and she holds up her phone and it's a picture of me. It was the strangest thing. I mean, does that happen to Brad Pitt? Right? Oh, that's kind of a weird comparison. I'm comparing myself to Brad Pitt. Channing Tatum, that's the people's sexiest man. Right? That's, that's who I should compare myself to. But I mean, I looked over and there I was staring at myself from this girl's phone. I thought, it's time to quit my halftime job. I have to leave now. So now my ride is 20 minutes each way on the max. I'm one of those max people now. Woo! Although when I have to go somewhere, I, I, the other day I took the bus to the pharmacy, so you can just fuck right off. And you know, one of the things I think that in my entire lifetime, I've had exactly as much anger as Doug expressed in his little 10 minute thing. <laughs> I wish I could muster that kind of anger. I knew this was gonna happen. He, he comes out. <laughs> Mr. Reagan comes out and he's like, ah, <laughs> And I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I, I was just in thought when I was at home. I'm like, I can tell them I have a water emergency in my basement. I don't have to go to this thing. So anyway, I quit my halftime job because internet celebrity was really weird. I tweet like two times a week now, much to the relief of all the people who defriended me and then friended me and everything. But I missed it, and I miss it still. And the first couple of days when I, I get on the Gateway Transit Center and I get off 22 minutes later, and the first couple of days I went too far on the train. And the first couple of days, I waited for the blue line to come, because the blue line is the one that goes out to Hillsboro, and that's the one I always had to wait for. But now I can take the red line, or the green line, or the blue line downtown, and it was a very strange experience for me. But something happened that really warmed my heart the other day, because I was kind of missing all the people, and missing the opportunity to dream up great marketing schemes, like a t-shirt that says, Thank you for not smelling too weird to wear on, on the bus. But I got on the train and a little old lady was little old lady. Like I'm in my mid fifties. I'm not gonna say that's the last time I ever gonna say little old lady in my whole life. Uh, remember Mrs. Howell from Gilligan's Island? 
This is how Owl got on the bus. <laughs> and you know how sometimes people have a conversation and you think they must have a, like a Bluetooth headset in that you just like, they have their head turned? And she started saying, and it's just the most horrible thing. They, they touch each other's buttholes. <laughs> and I'm looking for the headset. She turns her head, there's no headset. I'm like, this is more like it. This is more like the experience that I'm used to on my long commute on the train and on the 57. And she went on and on about how they touched each other's buttholes and how it was a terrible thing. And then she looked over and gave me the most disturbing grin I've ever seen in my entire life. And I felt at home again. It felt so good. So, you know, it turns out that it's all the same. I mean, whether you ride 20 minutes or whether you ride two hours, or whether you don't ride at all, that you just have to be there and be into it and knock things off the wall in the sheer presence of your, uh, of your abilities. But now I'm not so guilty anymore, and I get on the train at the same time I used to get on the train, at 10 minutes till seven, and I take the same blue line, and I get home three hours earlier than I used to. And I sit there, because I can't figure out what the fuck to do with three hours after in my day, when I would be tweeting before, but it doesn't feel the same at my computer at home, so I don't do that anymore. And I'm not guilty anymore. And I think that the best thing that came out of that was the little old lady. And just the fact that I'm finally home in the afternoons. And I'm uh, going to read something now in large print. Gonzo shirt and reading glasses. I don't know if that really matches up that well. Very attractive people. That's good. <laughs> so, this is in honor of Doug, who was worried that people were going to do some really sort of soft and lovely things. And so, I'm going to do a soft and lovely thing here and read a few paragraphs out of something that I wrote for TriMet Diaries a little while ago. And it turns out that one of the things that's the same thing for me is my walk to the transit center every day. Between me and the Gateway Transit Center each morning are obstacles large and small. The last few deep, warm, hypnagogic breaths of slumber. The sum of human motivation and desire coupled with the American work ethic. Work ethic. The reluctance to leave her side, the steadfast tree in my front yard. Obstacles, yes, to be overcome on the first leg of the long journey to work each day via foot and train and bus. The tree is ripe with the promising buds of spring, and its top branches are losing a grip on a fat, full yellow moon slung low in the early morning sky. The moon must be a pretty desirable prize, as the tree seems to really be trying, clawing at the last buttery edge, fighting a losing battle, but resolute in its desire to not let go. I descend the two slick steps from the front stoop, and I stride across the unknown grass of my front lawn on a path to intersect the moon to fall low enough to touch the horizon. Like the tree, I'm destined to fail. Like the tree, I'm resolute, and I shall make the attempt no matter how predestined the outcome. This is what I do. Here's where you live. You live in that moment between inhale and exhale, in that heartbeat, in that acknowledgement of breath and bone. You live in the tree that grasps at the full moon. You live in a river of concrete. You live wherever your gaze takes you, to the last sideways crescent sliver of moon as it dips below the horizon line, to the rain-slick train platform that serves to take me farther from you as you sleep, to the indigo sky that warms as the sun slowly climbs up behind you. You live in every step I take. You live forever in every fold of my clothing, under every fingernail, in each laugh line that I've earned. I take you with me on my morning walk to the train station and I bring you back and then I find you alive and real in my home and I know what real happiness is. And in the morning, as a squirrel steps out to find me and guide me to my street, you live in me again. Thanks.
Scott Tudor, ladies and gentlemen. Well next we have a very special guest. Uh, I'm gonna start from the beginning. Uh, it's Herr Dr. Professor Lipschitz. It very rarely makes a North American appearance. He's also known on Twitter as Ancient Portland. So we have uh, the, the privilege of having uh, Herr Dr. Professor Lipschitz uh, joining us this evening. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over to the doctor. spectacles, but uh, I hope you'll forgive me at my informality. Um, this evening I'm going to speak to you about TriMet Through the Ages to provide an historical perspective on uh, the themes that others have already been discussing. Uh, most of you, when you think of the history of TriMet, I'm sure have a kind of irrational nostalgia for the orange buses that once populated this fair city. Is that feedback or is <laughs> shrieking in horror? <laughs> <laughs> but I'd like to look at the history of TriMet, uh, going back much further. Uh, for those of you who uh, follow me on Twitter, uh, this won't be much of a surprise, but uh, TriMet actually goes back uh, to the very beginnings of art. <laughs> uh, and let me start by uh, giving you a sense um, of the cosmology of the Portmanian universe uh, prior uh, to the present age. That is, as you may be aware, it is um, illustrated here in this map, uh, thanks to the kind folks at OMSI for providing me. Uh, in the pre Antonican universe, uh, it was believed that the heavens occupied the outermost sphere, that is, uh, the Earth was surrounded by uh, concentric spheres, um, heavens at the outermost, and at the innermost uh, was the Earth, and it was believed that hell itself was actually located at the back of the number 12 box. <laughs> 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 Here I have an early illustration. You may be probably familiar with uh, Jeff Goose Hollow, one of the most uh, eminent uh, representatives of the late medieval uh, tradition here in Portland. Uh, it's taken from the legend of St. Edward, which I didn't bother to tell you the background story, but obviously you know that. Uh, but here's the detail of the famous altarpiece in uh, the Portland Art Museum, uh, in which we see a representation of St. Edward. Uh, forced to sit at the back of the bus. Uh, as it seen, as you know from uh, the previous stories, we narrated these kind of horrendous events, uh, particularly as we near the crashing of the border. In fact, Dante himself, the great Florentine poet, as you know, uh, spent some time in Portland uh, in his famous uh, believed, in fact, that those guilty of the sin of unsustainability uh, uh, forced to spend their lives uh, wedged between uh, bickering meth addicts on the number 12. So, uh, and I know that even in the phases when I have been considered being unsustainable, I myself have been uh, suffered this. <laughs> now, the number 12 plays quite an important role in what I'm going to talk about uh, this evening, uh, because really we could see it as uh, the heart of Portland, Sandy Boulevard, and uh, quite simply put in ancient Portlandian cosmology, the number 12 is very significant. Uh, now, one interesting tidbit um, is, of course, when uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe was in Portland, um, he, as you all know, had very detailed diaries of his travels, and uh, you have probably seen his name, uh, 
as it is here, he is wearing actually the first uh, Snuggie. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, this is <laughs> most people wear them. Uh, most of those who wear them didn't make it out. Um, but, um, as you know, Goethe was very critical of Portland, uh, the quite contrary of the New York Times in that regard. And he said, and I don't mean to offend you, but this is kind of what I mean. But uh, uh, that means uh, without exception, toothless, infirm, obese, or deranged. Now, uh, this has been quite controversial, uh, this passage from this uh, Portlandish advisor of the <laughs> because, uh, frankly, you don't seem to be any of those things to me. Uh, but what recent studies have suggested is that he spent his entire journey on the number 12 bus. In fact, that's the only way he could have reached this conclusion. And recent analysis have shown that this famous portrait in fact, shows him uh, off what is now Sandra Bullock. Distinctive round crenellated structure is now the quite prime red restaurant. <laughs> 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 and it's remarkable to see it now when Sandra was right. Uh, meadows full of ruins and shepherds and the like. Uh, but uh, still a misery spot. I wish we could know if he had dined there. Uh, now, I'd like to talk about the origin of the name Trimet. It's a mysterious word which has mm, very few analogies in standard English. Um, but what I would suggest um, is that the traditional understanding that uh, those who work at TriMet, I, my apologies to anyone who might, uh, that this traditional idea that it comes from the Greek word trismegistus, uh, meaning thrice great, is, is probably incorrect. Um, and I know you've all probably grown up hearing just this theory. But to say, you know, once great, perhaps. But the price is, is quite a high number. Um, and in fact, this argument was uh, debunked uh, already in the 19th century by the great classicist uh, Heinrich Schliemann. Um, and you may be already familiar with his work on uh, uh, the Greek world in antiquity. Uh, but perhaps you've not read his magisterial Geschichte des Wortes Trimet in Altertum, that is, uh, the history of the word Trimet in antiquity, published in 1875. Uh, this work um, really, I think, settles the argument as far as I'm concerned that we can think of this Greek word, um, that the word trimet, um, in fact, uh, first appears in a, a fragment 